and resorting. Hello, everyone. My name is Denise Astorino. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the Community Engagement Coordinator for the LGBT Community Center of Greater Cleveland. As normal, uh, every few months, we've been doing the LGBTQ plus artist talk spotlights. And our first one for 2022 is one of my dearest friends. I've known her for longer than I can remember, um, Alison Garrigan. And we have tried a few other times to schedule these. So I am thrilled that we are finally able to sit and chat with Allie. Um, Allison, as you, if you don't know, uh, if, you, if you are in theater and the arts, you, you have heard her name synonymous with many different productions and many different roles that she's played. She is known as a director, an actor, a singer. She does puppeteering, she creates them. So many fields that this woman has been in since I have known her and before that. So we are thrilled to talk with her a little bit today. Um, yeah, I get to a little bit about know her, her, her history and you know her journey as an artist. So Allie, thank you for joining us today. Hello. Gonna, hello, we're gonna talk for a little bit. So I wanna get rid of the screen share really quick and pull us up hello hello how are you <laughs> doing well doing well Thanks. like just thrilled that we're actually able to sit and talk with each other finally. i wanted to say i wanted to say when you said we've known each other for a long time i want to say we've known each other for years exactly so. <laughs> you get that little like that little like uh screen that they put over the mouth for like we don't want to talk about age. yes yeah <laughs> So, but yeah, I mean, to figure, I just turned 48 and I've known you since my early 20s. So it's been- That's right. That's right. Because I, I met you when you were still at CSU. When did I? No, no Lorraine Because you went back college. to school. For, yeah, 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 yeah. So Lorraine we've been college. Each other for a long time. So, yeah. But I like so, to say we've known each other since I had hormones and a waist. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Did I ever have weight? No, anyway, but yes, yeah. since I had hair, yes. Uh, yes. But yeah, so, but I, you know, these are real informal, as you can tell by now, but um, I just, I've been, as I think we discussed the history of the, the, the artist talks is we started during uh, the stay home ordinance with uh, COVID and mm -hmm. it was, it's just a way to you know, in visit with some of the some of the artists, the LGBTQ plus artists in Cleveland, because we have such a thriving community oh, yes. of artists in, in, that identify, and it, it just it was giving them a platform to um, to showcase their work. And you are a you are a staple in the community in so many ways, and so I'm thrilled to be able to have you share your journey. Oh, well, thank us. you. Yeah. And I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, you know, uh, first of all, I just, I was really honored when you asked if I wanted to do this. And then I started looking at some of the company I was keeping in these talks and I was like, oh, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's been, um, it's, I, I look forward to like reviving these in 2022. But um, so talking about you, I mean, like I said, you have done, you have done an array of things, which we will talk about um, back in the slides again. But can you tell me a little bit about, like, I just want you to have free reign. You know, I want you to talk about how you started your childhood, because you have such a colorful childhood with your parents and your family. And then we'll just go and we'll talk about some of the different aspects of your journey. So, oh, that, that's great. Um, well, let's see. I was born uh, to an arts family. My uh, grandfather, Arthur, was a composer who was uh, considered to be the father of the what they called then the American Indian musical movement, the recognition of the contribution of Native American music to just the sphere of music. Mm -hmm. um, and he created the created and ran the Wawan Press, which was huge at the time. Um, and my father and mother are both equity actors. Well, my mother was, she's passed. And so I was raised in an equity family uh, by actors, which means I was basically raised by wolves. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> not a bad place to be raised by, yeah. uh, but, um, but it also meant there was not going to be any escape for me. My sister and I both wound up in the arts. It's what we knew from early days. It's really, really shaped the way that 
we view the world, the way that I view the world, the way that I find myself in the world. Um, and I've also got very high level ADHD. And so I was, which if anybody knows me, hello, um, uh, <laughs> look, a kitty. Yeah. Uh, but, um, <laughs> yes. uh, but, um, but it was a good way to keep me thriving and whole to get me into the arts. So my parents very, very early on got me very deeply immersed in the theater world and recognized that it was gonna take a lot to keep my brain engaged. So anything that I was interested in, they got me training. They found a way to get me what I needed so that I wasn't just like stabbing in the dark. I was actually learning how to do these things and, and really give, being given the tools to feel successful in all of my projects, even the failures. I mean, it was great. There were so many things that I've tried that I was like, yep, and that didn't go so well, won't do that again, but I had the freedom to do it. And I was given the tools to be able to try it, which was which was really great. Um, so I grew up with that. Um, I, I feel really lucky because I grew up in a very open environment. I grew up in Seattle uh, mostly, and that's where I consider myself to be from. And it was basically in the 60s in Seattle was basically like living in Haight-Ashbury and, you know, essentially it was, you know, hippy dippy land, but it, would, it also meant that it was a, a much more open minded, uh, um, accepting environment, you know, add the arts plus that, you know, I mean, I'm old enough to remember the summer of love, you know, and so it's like, it, and I wasn't at Woodstock, but I remember that it was happening. Right. Um, you know, and and so I got, I had a rather unusual upbringing in that respect because not only was I encouraged artistically, but I was also encouraged in self-expression, which, mm. and acceptance, uh, you know, in large measure. Um, and so I think that that really has colored a lot of what I've, what I've done in the arts. I was also growing up at a time when going to a college and getting a degree wasn't necessarily what one needed in order to, move forward in the arts and to be successful in the arts. It was more about what I call trench experience, yeah. um, which I think is really important. Field, field work, field experience, you know, whatever you want to call it. So that was a plus and a minus because later, of course, it came back and bit me because I didn't have a degree because I went, jumped right into being a professional in various fields. But, you know, yeah. that's, that's kind of where I got that's kind of where I got to deciding not what I wanted to be when I grow up, because I still don't know that, but at least, you know, how I want to start going through my creative adolescence, let's call it yeah. that, you know, so yeah, it's, yeah. yeah so. Well, so you make a good point. I mean, so we know the, we, you know, I, as, as someone who teaches college as well, part-time, every once in a while, I'll, I'll do some adjunct work, but I know I didn't go back to school until like late thirties, you know? And so, but we talk about like the importance of the degree and everything else, but the training, the training interspersed with that is important as well. Yes. And you, can you talk a little bit about, even though you at the time did not get the degree and everything else, can you talk a little bit about some of the important like the important moments of some of the trench training that you did, some of the ones that really like made made an impact in your Absolutely. career as you are now. So, Absolutely. I, I think I, I like to say that two of the most important internships that I wound up doing as part of my training were both at the Cleveland Playhouse, although there was uh, um, there were things before that and after that and all around that. I think that the two that really impacted who I became, who I have actually landed on and become outside of children's theater because my, my mother was my main mentor in children's theater and that's a whole different thing for me, um, was, uh, and we can talk about that in a minute if you want to, but um, were Jean Hare for puppetry and uh, Richard Gould for mask work. Okay. The two of them were, two of my favorite mentors and I got to actually work on an internship with both of them at the Playhouse to work on different things for different shows and it really it just cemented for me my love of bringing the inanimate to life mm -hmm. as part of the arts and mm -hmm. and it really helped me express a part of me that was nonverbal 
Gotcha. gotcha. You know, and, and so that, I think that was really good. And, and I still remember years and years and years later when I suddenly found myself working alongside, not in the same production, but working alongside both Jean and Richard as a peer. Oh, wow. And just, first of all, being terrified, but second of all, just, just going, this is so surreal. Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> because I had also known both, both Jean and, and Richard as, as professionals at the Playhouse who were compatriots and peers of my parents. Mm -hmm. So I knew them socially as well as professionally. And it was just really, 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 really interesting to suddenly be on a level with them and go, this is so, this is so. <laughs> like, this is really weird. I feel like a fake. <laughs> like, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. When that happens, it always, it, it always just kind of throws you a little bit because like, you know, for me, it was Holly you know, yeah, Holly, Holton, yes, like, absolutely. I, I, I did a show first with Holly and then she was the one that really encouraged me to go back to school. Absolutely. And now she's one of my dearest friends and to make that, you know, and the same thing, I mean, the same thing, like when I saw, when I met you, you were in Liz Estrada and then suddenly it's like, I'm in shows with you. And I'm like, What's happening? What's, know, what's happening? happening right yeah. now? I know. It's, I know. It's a very, it's a very, very, um, it's a very interesting situation when those roles change. Evie McElroy, who was one of my goddesses. I mean, she was one of my mom and dad. She was one of my mom's best friends, and mm -hmm. she was an incredible actress and just a just a a, a larger than life amazing person. Um, Dorothy Silver when I worked with both of them, you know, they had been, Dorothy kind of took me under her wing and sort of said, you know, I know your mom has passed away. If you ever need, I'm not going to be your mom, but if you need someone I'm here, which was amazing to me. And I always adored her. But the first time I worked with either of them professionally, I was like, I don't even have a, I, I, my, no words. It was just like, right. you know, I was like, yeah. So it's, it is, it's a really weird, it's really weird experience when you start working with someone who you have looked up to or seen from afar and had sort of a, you know, like a, a, an aura around them or a reputation or something. And then suddenly you're in that circle and it's just, how did, how, how do I fit in here? And how did I get here in the first place? It's like, ah, you know, so it's, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I want to, I want to, so talking about the different, these different areas and these roles that you have, you know, we're going to start with actor first okay. um, and discuss some of, um, some of the highlights of your, um, we've got some slides and stuff, but can you, can you talk to me? I mean, you came from a very eclectic background, right. but very, um, you know, very supportive in these different, these areas of your life. And you said like helping to, um, it helps shape who you were and, you know, in regards to creativity, yes, but your self-expression and your self-identity, I mean, these are LGBTQ plus talks. And I'm I know sorry. that yeah. we have discussed, we have discussed how you um, identify within the communities and everything. Can you talk a little bit about, um, how like how you identify because I don't want to tell your story but yeah. how you identify and how has that how has that shaped your uh, like as actor and you know what I mean mm -hmm. especially as an actor back you know it, it, things have changed now and they're still changing yes. which is good but like 80s 90s 2000 things like that how oh, has <laughs> what do you say before them yeah. <laughs> well yes. the yeah. <laughs> how, how is the how has how has this shaped that and how has that really kind of set the path for you well first of all I identify as bi um mm -hmm. my pronouns are she her but I have always um I refer to myself as androgynous mm -hmm. Okay, I uh, do not apply that to anyone else. That is my own terminology. I grew up, I'm older, I'm in my 60s. Um, I grew up with a different set of 
terminologies and understandings of representation and presentation and everything else. Um, and I have always been perceived as fluid, I guess one could say, uh, for better, for, for, you know, no better. I don't know that that really fits into how I'm describing myself, but I have always referred to myself as androgynous. And that, again, that's the term that I knew when I was growing up. It was the term that was applied to me and it felt comfortable. Absolutely. So that is what I refer to myself as. I, mm -hmm. I don't use that to describe anyone else. You know, that's just for me. Um, and I fully respect that in a lot of circles, it's not a, a term that people are really comfortable with at this point, And that's fine with me. I have no, no qualms with that. Um, but I, uh, I found that what it did for me was to really let myself, let myself put it out there, so to speak, without barriers. I was able to sort of go in any direction that I needed to be pulled in or I felt myself pulled in or, you know, and, and as a result, I think what happened, particularly as an actor in, you know, in that first sense, people saw me as being much more versatile mm -hmm. than they would have had I locked myself in and not been able to express all of the different aspects of who and what I am. Right. Um, so I think that in, in that sense, it was very helpful. I think that it, it's, it was a double-edged sword on a certain level because it also sort of, people would look at me and go, we're not really sure what you're showing us here. Again, very different period of time. People were really kind of like, you must fit into this neat little package. And if you do not fit into this neat little package, we don't know what to do with you. And right. that's exactly what happened to me a lot. You know, I'm five foot 10. Um, I'm angular. Um, I, you know, until, <laughs> until post menopause, I was always very sort of, you know, um, I was, I, I was not a curvy woman, shall we say, uh, but I was, uh, um, and I have a very sort of uh, strong presence. Um, I've, I've actually been referred to as a laser beam by people who've worked for me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, but I, I hope that's in a good way. I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> um, intense. In, in, I'm an intense human being, but, mm. but, but it, it, it served me more frequently than it did not serve me to be able to just come in and go, what you see is what you get. This is my energy. This is the way I present myself. This is how I identify. Y'all can bite me if you don't like it, you know? So, and I think that that, that was really, really helpful to me as an artist. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think that it's, a, it's important. It's important because you were, you were breaking barriers, you know, you were, you were breaking stereotypes and archetypes because I think where in regards, especially to theater, um, you, I mean, you were, you were a force that was breaking stereotypes. You were like, you were playing these roles that people were in plays that really could not be, they, they were hard to fill, you know, they were hard to fill at the time. And so maybe you wouldn't get cast as Cinderella. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, but I'd get cast as Maleficent really fast. Yeah, yeah yes, exactly. So I, I love the fact that it wasn't that you don't, and in the theater, I mean, it's, uh, or in perform like in Ingenue, you know, okay. you were, you were by far a character actress and a lead who like enmeshed these different, the, you know, these these total different like paradigms in it and you were breaking stereotypes which was which was huge well, it was important yeah thank it's you. it's extremely important especially where we are now you know especially yep. where it's very um it's important that everyone whether you are cisgender transgender whether you're you're black you're white you're a person of color a woman I mean, however you identify that you are getting these equal these equal opportunities yes and that is a huge that's a huge conversation that we can have and it's an important conversation to have and i think that you i believe that if with what i've seen you do with what i've been um involved with you in and not just in acting, but in all of your things, there is that, 
there's that core there okay. that yeah breaking these breaking stereotypes and breaking barriers so well, and, I, and I think it's worth bringing up again the fact that when I first got started we're talking about the 1970s and early 80s mm -hmm. you know so it was a very different uh, atmosphere society was very different there was a lot of up in arms there was a lot of there was a lot of judgment happening there was a lot of really striving against strict censure and you know and stuff um and i think that one of the things that that i was always really glad that i had kind of the opportunity to do was just to go in and just present myself and say take it or leave it you know, I, I'm not going to change for you. I'm not going to let you tell me that I can be, or I can't be, you know, if you want me, you want me, but if you don't, that's fine too. Cause mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not going to compromise to yeah. be, you know, and, and that's one thing I think that, that anyone who knows me knows is that I kind of have managed to carry that through my entire life, that whole refusing to compromise. It's yeah. not always served me in the best stead, perhaps, you know, and I don't mean as far as being by, I mean, just attitudinally but um i just think that that i really am grateful for the upbringing that i had because i think it really gave me the strength to just say no i don't i, I will not compromise i will collaborate but i will not compromise right. you know i am not going to compromise my beliefs or who i am or how i present or what my ideas of how art should be done are because of your ideas of it. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, I, and I really, until I talk to someone like you who brings this up, I, I really, I, I don't really look back and go, I guess I kind of was a boundary breaker. And I guess I kind of was a groundbreaker in some regards, you know? And, and I think that that's, that's a little, it's a little weird to wrap my head around that because I don't think of myself that way, you know? And yet I, I do know that, that, that on, on many fronts, I've been considered to be a leader, you know, um, you know, I started my own theater and, you know, all the other things, but I just, to really think about the impact that I might possibly have had on other people's lives or on art itself is, is sort of, that's an introspection that I don't, I don't go there as often as maybe I should. I don't know, you know. I think you do it innately though. I mean, that's the thing is, is that I don't, I, I, I don't think, I think why it is like, why it is so impactful is, is because it just was in your nature. You know, you didn't sit there and go out and go, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to identify as bi and then I'm going to break all the, you know, you just were being who you were. Yeah, thank and you. just to, you know, uh, before we get into the, the actual talk about like the different roles and everything, I just want to express I know a lot of amazing people who identify as bi and we've discussed this and it is it it is an identity that has gotten has gotten flack in the past and it is so important to identify the importance of uh, you know there is someone who it goes again with the histories that we talk about it's important right to me, like so many people I know to tie, like to talk to older artists and just like older people in the community in general to tie the histories with where we are now and where we are going, Right. you know? And someone identifying as bi is huge, you know, because it shows that it wasn't just a passing phase that, be, I mean, there is, there is you just can't make up your mind. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. And it is so important for people to to see who may be younger right now, who identify in as by like to see that, you know, to have that identity, to look and say, hey, this person, I see myself in this person. I see the struggles that they have. I see the loves and the and the things that they've gone through. So just to solidify how val valid and valued um people are that identify that way you know yeah and yeah and just the importance of the like i said the histories the histories of telling the stories of people who identify in this community and to show the parallel of where 
we have come throughout the, you know, throughout the timeline. So, well, I love uh, in the arts, but just in the community itself, that people are beginning to feel the freedom to actually be who they are and just stand up and say, you know what? I don't know if I'm allowed to swear on this or not. So, you know, but you know, Shit. <laughs> oh, you freaks who can't dance. You know, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. like, I just, yeah. I cannot, I, it really, it is amazing to me to watch how far we have come. Yeah. And to see that, yes, the fight still is ongoing on so many levels. And it's such a hard fight, but that it is being fought, you know, and that people are beginning to just say, this is me. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. it. This is me. And I'm proud of that fact. Yeah. You yeah. know, and I, I think that's, that's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. So kudos, kudos Thank again. You. So, all right, let me do this whole screen share business. Ooh, I, I keep hoping technology. Someday, <laughs> yeah. I keep hoping that someday I figure out a, a smoother way to do this, but that's well, okay. I'm a graphics artist. And if you ever figure that out, let me know. Okay. <laughs> I am no good with PowerPoint to save my soul. <laughs> all good. All good. All right. So boom, here we are. And where did we go? After. Hey. Yay. All right. So this first, <laughs> the uh, first slide, why don't you talk about this amazing uh, image here? <laughs> oh, well, my goodness. Uh, this is me in my natural habitat. No, um, I'm, <laughs> well, maybe. But anyway, uh, this was from the secretaries at mm -hmm. Cleveland Public Theater. And I don't remember the year that we did this. You were in this show with me, darling. I was, I was. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, going to say 2000, 2005, 2004, 2005. Was it that long? Was it that late? Okay, so very possibly because, yeah, I did, I, I'd already been at CPT for quite a few years by then. Um, this is a wonderful show called The Secretaries uh, that is, uh, it was, it was, I don't know, how would you describe this show? I guess it's kind of tongue in cheek, Grand Guignol. Uh, well, I mean, it was, it was developed by the five lesbian brothers. So yes, exactly. take it from there. Yeah. Take it from there. And yeah. um, most of the humor in it is highly inappropriate and, you know, uh, would probably piss off a lot of people at this point, but for when it was written, <laughs> it was it was quite innovative and, and very, very funny. Um, so basically in this shot, we have all just murdered a lumberjack and smeared ourselves with their blood and now are uh, partying about yeah. it. So yeah. yeah. There was, and then there the was newsroom also to speak and that yeah. picture. Liz, oh, <laughs> yeah. There, it was, um, you know, and the five lesbian brothers, I mean, they were, they were huge in the guerrilla theater movement. Yes, absolutely. I mean, yeah. And um, just keeping this like open for, you know, a variety of audience members who would watch this, like guerrilla theater, like taking a play, taking a script and putting it on in a surprise, wherever it may fit. They did it in subways. They, they would do it in like city hall, you know, Lobbies. lobbies they would yeah they would yes. go yeah all over the place you know yes. they would do it on the front porch of i mean the front steps of a library whatever yes. um often, i think at the time very political and oh very political yeah yeah and this particular show one of the things that worked with it is it just took sexual stereotypes mm -hmm. and turned them on their heads i mean yeah. just it just turned everything inside out and mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I was actually playing the boss in this show and it was, it was wonderful because I just got to, uh, we all just kind of got to strut, strut our stuff and let our freak flags fly. And it was great. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was yeah. just so much fun and, you know, it was, and it was such a great group of women to be doing it too. And talk about a room full of strong female present, well, actually cisgendered females in a room. It was, yeah. I mean, it was, it was incredible. Who all was in that? It was you, me, Meg, uh, Liz, Liz, Shafia. Shafia. And that was it. it. Yeah, it was the five. It was, it was the, the five, five lesbian yeah. brothers. Yeah. Yeah. What a heck of a heck of a show. So yes, it was it was hilarious. It was absolutely okay. hilarious. So then moving on to the next one. Oh, one of my favorites. 
Mrs. Lovett in Sweeney Todd, uh, which was a bucket list role for me. And I really wanted to, to play it. Uh, and I got the chance to do it in probably one of the best professional productions of it that I have ever been aware of. Um, okay. And where was it? This was at Lakeland Theater, and mm -hmm. uh, which is not necessarily known as a professional company, but it's a they, it's a professional company. And they did this insane production of this that just sold out every single performance. It, there was not a weak link in the cast. It was just one of those perfect storms where everything came together. And one of the things that I loved about doing this role is as with the secretaries, what a lot of people don't know about me is that I'm actually a comedian. And I don't mean I'm a stand up comic. I mean, as an actress, I'm a comedic actress. Yeah. And because I also do Shakespeare and I do rock and roll and I play the dragon lady a lot and stuff like that. But what people don't realize is that I'm kind of a Lucille Ball when it comes to, you know, no, I'm not that level of genius, but I mean, you know, I, I, I thrive when I'm given the really weird comic stuff to do. I hear that. You know? yeah. and, and so this was, this was just such a, a, it was just so amazing and just a romp. It was an utter romp. The only thing that marred it for me is that on our first, on our 10 out of 12, we got on the set and it was like a six inch, it was a rate stage with a six inch, inch step on it, not even like a four, four inch step on the end of it. And I had on my little, my little costume shoes that had a little, you know, inch and a half heel on them. And I stepped off the ramp, uh, off the step and I went one way and my knee went the other. And I wound up doing the entire show in a robo brace and had to have uh, knee surgery as soon as the show closed. Oh my God. I didn't I did know the this. The whole run in a robo brace. Yeah. Oh, honey. Oh my yeah, God. That was fun. That was fun. And, and you still did it. <laughs> you well, it was interesting. It, it gave me part of Mrs. Lovett's physicality. Yeah, I sort of had a, a weird gate for her and it wasn't, it wasn't anything I'd planned. It just happened. So I was like, all right, there you go. Talk, talk about method acting. Oh my God. Oh, you well, know. I mean, I don't know that I'd do it again. I only have one more meeting, Yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> wow. Oh, wow. Okay. So then, oh God. I, I see this on every one of them. I'm like, oh, well, my favorite. Yeah. yeah. So talk this is about Titus. This is Titus, a grand and gory rock opera that was done at CPT. Um, I, this is kind of the stuff that I'm known for musically, this, doing this kind of role on stage, mm -hmm. the rock and roll thing that I do, because you know, I, I, I'm old enough that I was, in the, I was literally in the original punk scene and then I was in the original goth scene and I'm dating myself and it's time to break up, but you know. Um, so, <laughs> This was an amazing piece. Uh, Craig George, the director, uh, took Titus Andronicus, the Shakespeare, and said, and came to Raymond over at CPT and said, I want to turn this into a rock musical. Um, and I want to use Shakespeare's text, but I need people who can do the, um, the lyrics and the music. And uh, I really would love to have Ali play Tamara because we'd already worked together on some other stuff. Yeah. And it just so turned out that <laughs> Raymond looked at him and said, well, what if Allie was your lyricist and the guy she works with for, has worked with for years as a collaborator is the composer. Oh my God. And it worked out beautifully. And it was an incredible production complete with a splatter zone. I got killed at the end with a corkscrew that went into my eye and then into my jugular. Uh, so there was blood everywhere oh. i mean everybody died there was a there was a castration on stage there was mutilations that was just it was it, it, it was grand guignol it was just total grand yeah. guignol theater and this the one on the right in the multicolor thing was sort of the david bowie influenced number and uh you know it was it was it was an insane show and it was absolutely amazing. It was, yeah, it was intense. I remember seeing, I don't know how many times I saw it when it, and just uh, again, so CPT, uh, Cleveland Public Theater. For those oh yeah, guys. sorry, I should, I should yeah. say oh, that's that. That's okay, that's oh. all right, that's why I'm here. So yeah, I mean, it was intense. I, I think I saw it at least three times when I was there. So I was, yeah, it was, um, it had everything and it really, I really love the adaptations because it really did not shy away from the gore that is Titus. 
I mean, Titus is a bloodbath, you know, I mean, yeah, this he totally person, told the story. Yeah. 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 So I love that. I love that. So it was fun. And it was, and it was really great too, because, uh, I've been a lyricist for, uh, bands and stuff like that in the past. Mm -hmm. And, um, when with Dennis, the, who wound up being the composer for this, uh, mm -hmm. actually being the person who I worked with to create those pieces. So I already knew how working with him was going to go. Mm -hmm. And then we had the most incredible, we had Brad Weiner, uh, who, if you know, Bradley Weiner in, oh, yeah. in you know, in, in the, in the uh, LGBTQ plus community, or if you just know him through theater, he's brilliant. And he was our arranger, which was, you know, and the musical director. So he was amazing. It was, it was just a really great, great production. Absolutely, absolutely. So speaking of, because you've mentioned it a few times, haha, look at that. So Who knew? a segue. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, look how la that happens. And Ooh. then I ruined it by bad jokes. But yes, yeah, so musician, you were in the punk scene, you're in the goth scene, you worked with, what is Dennis's last name again? Urich. Gen Dennis Urich. Yeah. So Who is I brilliant. Wanna, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, I agree. So we've got a couple pictures of like to kind of symbolize different bands that you've worked with talk about musician um so you are in this one who are you i'm uh this was a susie sue from susie and the banshees tribute yeah. um it's interesting because i've always been told that i look a lot like her and i actually sound a lot like her when i do rock and roll um and we're also uh, uh, we are also um, peers in that we are of the same age and we're in the same scene and everything and, and have basically mm -hmm. the same kind of progression. She started out in the punk scene, then went into the post-punk scene, then went into the goth scene, which is exactly what I did. She became a lot more famous than I did. So <laughs> she's yeah. wrangling. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> um, she was always one of my goddesses. I mean, I just adored her. She and Patti Smith and, uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, oh my God, what's her name from X-Ray Specs? You know, all, all of those people who from the punk era that I was watching as I was working and learning how to be, you know, in the rock scene. Um, but we did a benefit for the food bank and we did it as a Susie Sue tribute one night. Mm -hmm. And so that's what this is. And it was great because the first half of the show showcased the punk aspect of her, of Susie and the Banshees of Susie Sue. And then the second act, I went off stage and did a costume change and came back on and it was the goth scene. Uh, you know, the goth side of her that she turned into the post-punk and, and goth scene that she yeah. went into. Um, so it was really wonderful to be able to actually do her music on stage, which is something that I have always wanted to do. Yeah. But, um, but I was in, you know, I was, and I was in my own, in punk bands and I was in a new wave band for a while, which was a little too, you know, light toast for me. But um, we did, uh, we, uh, so being from a punk band and then going into a gothic industrial band was you know was great and then this actually is later in my career mm -hmm. this is only a few years ago and uh so it was wonderful to sort of be able to bring everything together and put it on stage with yeah. uh, this is frank perfect who you see here on screen with me he's also a brilliant musician and arranger and composer and mm -hmm. you know he he um is the uh, the owner of the center for rock research which is a a, a private rock club which is really yeah great. oh neat yeah so I, going on that before we before we talk about the next slide, can you give a little bit of with all of the training that you had um, as a performer? So what is your what's your vocal training? Because oh, you have a very yeah. distinct, very alto. Like I don't know if you identify. Well, I'm actually a mezzo, or... believe it or not. But when I do rock and roll, I sing in my lower range because I'm yeah. not going to kill myself. Um, yeah. uh, I I started training when I was 14 uh, with private teachers um and i have trained in everything from music for theater to uh jazz to uh folk i have classical a classical background i even started training in opera um mm -hmm. until they looked at me and said you uh, you are not your fa which means the, the type of voice you have to, you're going to walk in and they're going to go soprano uh, no you're not even, we're not even going to listen to you. You don't look it, never mind. Yeah. So, uh, so I got out of that pretty quickly, but, um, so I have a pretty extensive training, vocal training, which I think has served me well, because 
in all the years that I was doing rock and roll, I still have my full range. So, um, and I have like a, I think I have like a three octave range, something like that. Um, and I've managed to hang on to all of it because I was trained well enough and listened to them that I was able to do the things that I needed to do in rock and roll, which of course is my first love without damaging my vocal cords, which mm -hmm. is kind of a neat trick. That is a couple of scares, I will say, but I've, I've not would managed yeah. to come through fairly unscathed. So. Yeah. I just, I remember all of like in the stuff that we've been in, uh, like I like the vocal exercises that you do and how particular you are in like, you've got your water, you've got your lemon, you've got your, you know, you, you know, things like that. And I just remember, you know, for somebody I've lost some of my range throughout the years, mostly because I didn't use it, but yes. I, I trained some, but it's important. The importance of taking care of your instrument is uh, it's huge. you, you really do. You, you've got to, you know, I, I quit smoking a long time ago. Um, I've now been sober for 16 years. Um, and yeah, and all of that was taking a toll, you know, drinking and smoking was definitely taking a toll on my vocal cords. And yeah. one of the reasons that I quit smoking was because I, I wanted to keep singing. Yeah. You know? And I, and it was the thing that really got me to go, well, you got a choice here, you know, yeah. You can either smoke or you can sing, but you're not gonna be able to do them both for very long, you know? Right. So, yeah. Right. So in lieu of that, okay. So then what do we have here? This is uh, me in one of my Gothic industrial bands. This is Q Up. This is where I actually met Dennis, Dennis Urich and where we became mm -hmm. collaborators. And um, I, it's hard to believe I ever had that much hair, I know. Um, <laughs> but it's, uh, uh, um, it was an incredible band. It actually wound up playing things like Lollapalooza. We went on tour. We produced multiple yeah. albums. It was very successful. Um, and it was also, again, at a time when there weren't a lot of female, strong female singers and personas who were just sort of in local scenes and whatnot. And one of the things that I learned early on in rock and roll that really helped me succeed was a let my full persona out just just be who you are be that laser beam do that androgynous whatever mm -hmm. whatever your energy is let that out let it shine let it go out there and then stop worrying about whether you sound pretty yeah and yeah. stop worrying about whether you look pretty yeah let's go out there and perform yeah, and that was that was the thing. And I had a very specific look on stage, but it was really just me. I mean, it, it was just me wearing some of my shinier clothes, you know. <laughs> so it's it's uh, uh, it, it again. It served me well to yeah. to just be who I was, how I was, no apologies, no questions, just do it. Mm -hmm. And you and either I, like me or you didn't, you know. Exactly, and I think that that's a really good. It's a really good way to describe, you know, you were never afraid to dive into the not being pretty, the, the, the dark, <laughs> yeah, the dark, yeah, the, some of the really darker roles oh. and that, and find, you know, and find the, and find the humanity in them and find the, you were never, you were never an, and you are never a an artist who is afraid to go into the darkness of it. You know, you have a good sense of with your own journey that you've been through dark times, light times, you know, it, it has all you you tap into that, which is so extremely important as as an actor. You know, well, I think it's really important no matter what your as a creative aspect yeah. that you embrace the darkness as well as the light, because I think that some of the most successful artists are the ones who admit that there's that dark there and, you know, and embrace it rather than fighting it, you mm -hmm. know, and, and I don't mean evil. I mean, right. just the, the, the pervasive darkness of the human soul that we're mm -hmm. always tempering with lightness, you know, and that is not necessarily an ugly evil thing. It's just a different shade. You know, it's just mm -hmm. a different, it's a different energy. It's a different place. You know, I refer to things as energy a lot because I do a lot of energy work. So yeah. as a result, you know, for me, it's light energy, it's dark energy, it's whatever. But I think that it's, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's important because it really, it really pushes the fact of like finding that creative freedom within vulnerability. 
Yes. You know, yeah. to, to really, to be able to, and everybody creates in their own way and everybody has their own process, but I really, one of the things that personally your performances is, is that there is a level of, there is a level of vulnerability that is deep. That is like, it, it's, yeah, it dives deep. Not, oh, it's so deep, but it <laughs> dives because you take your, you know, you take your, you take your insecurities and you take your, um, the things that you have been through, you take past experiences and past traumas and past successes and you put them all and you just say, you say, this is me, as you said, this is me. I'm not apologizing. I'm not, I'm just presenting it and sharing it with you right. with a professional edge. That's the thing. I think that that is a huge thing too, is, is because there is always a level of I'm sharing this with you. I'm sharing it freely. Now we're putting it away right now. You know what I mean? It, yes. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, you, you, you make the differentiation. You do, you have yeah. to, you, you can't, you can't just walking around oozing from your pores all the time because exactly just, that, exactly that, that way lies madness and that way you do get sucked into the dark and that's yeah. that there's no coming back from that so. and there is just a yeah and there is just a level you take the audience there with you and then you bring them back you don't oh, leave you. them like you know yeah so it's Thank just you. something that yeah absolutely absolutely okay so then hey Hey, Speaking director. of taking the audience <laughs> there and back, trying to do that segue. So, I was going to say, look at you being a professional host. Just I know, look at Damn. that business. Yeah, so director. Yes. As a director, you all over the place, like you've done different things. You've worked yes. with so many different theaters. Um, so this is just a few to categorize um, some of the stuff you've been. And I think that, um, well, there's a few different ones in there, but you know, it, 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 we talk a lot from this point on, we're doing a lot, we're talking a lot with children's theater, which, you know, you started Tailspinner, you know, that was your little seed. I still remember when you came, when we had coffee and you said, I have this idea. Yeah. Uh, I love telling people that story. I was like, look at what she's done. So, yeah. So, um, but as, as a director, I mean, talking about some of these, talking about this you find you you have no fear of exploring darkness with light, as you said, and humanity. And that creates a lot with fantasy, exploring fantasy and the puppetry. So talk to me about, during, with these slides, talk to me a little bit about each of these shows. So, so this is Loki and Lucy. This is a Tailspinner. And um, I, uh, without getting too heavily into how Tailspinner worked, we always presented a playwright or plays by area playwrights. It was part of the mission was to nurture uh, area playwrights. And uh, this was by um, Mike, Guy Mike Geither, uh, Michael Geither. And it was the Loki story. And how do you bring that into the present and engage children in it? When, when you get right down to it, you know, regardless of what you've seen in the Marvel, you know, the MCU, um, the Loki stories are really, they're, they're dark, they're really dark, but because we wanted to tell stories of other nationalities and other cultures, um, we wanted to bring this in because it's also very important because it's huge mythology from a different culture. So how did we, how did we make this work? Well, we took some of the more lesson filled but humorous events in the Loki stories, cutting out some of the icky stuff, um, and then brought it into a modern girl's world. This is Missy Crumb and Brian uh, Ritchie in, uh, in oh. here. Yeah. And, uh, um, and we brought fantasy into it with puppets and with song and with stylized movement and with, and overall invited the kids to understand that it didn't matter that this was from a different culture, that there was stuff that anyone can connect with, mm -hmm. that speaks to anyone. And one of the things I always made sure of doing in children's theater is not to just completely turn your back on the dark side of it because life has a dark side to it. And I don't mean that we have to walk around dragging our knuckles on the ground going, oh, the weariness, the pain. I mean, just 
yeah. that there is a reality around us that isn't all unicorns and rainbows. And that maybe kids who have an understanding that it's okay to express that have a better handle on how to move through it. You know Absolutely. what I mean? So we, we incorporated a lot of that and I loved this show, I really did. It was one of the more difficult ones to do again because of where the source materials came from, but it wound up being an audience favorite and one of my favorites as well, so. Wonderful, okay. So then the next one, not children's uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> One of my favorite shows ever. Thank you, David Hansen, I love you forever. One um, of my favorites too, so. Uh, well, I was involved with the show on, I believe, you know, I believe four different iterations. Uh, the first one of which I was the musical director. Uh, Dennis and I wound up composing uh, the music and recording it. Uh, for the show. And then uh, I did the soundtracking for it and the costumes. And then when we did it again, we did it, I, I want to say we did it three more times. We did. We did it three more times. Uh, okay. One as a workshop, two as a workshop, and one as a professional production. Two of all three, all three of the, the second one, I know, back up. First one was at Nabama. The other three were at CPT in various different programs. Um, and it was wonderful to be with this show from its inception to watch the way that it grew and talk about embracing the dark. I mean, we're <laughs> in the goth scene here and it's about a man who is, the, the man singing uh, is uh, um, singing is a vampire and is singing to a man who is not a vampire. And it's all about the psychology of what happens when someone changes you, you know, at the end of it, you're like, were they, weren't they, were they really, were they not? Yeah. But, but it basically comes down to, you know, it's all about the psychology of what are the things that make us change mm -hmm. and what, and how much do what we believe, does what we believe change us? So it was, yeah, it was an amazing, very dark, very witty show. And yeah. it was the first thing I ever, it was the first time I ever met David Hansen. And it was the first time I ever collaborated with him on anything. And that's it's been it. a long and storied collaboration between both me and Dennis and between me and David. So. Gotcha. Well, and it shows too in the depth of the work, you know? I mean, there's yeah. a trust there that is. There's a very deep trust there. Yeah. There really is, yeah. Okay, so then again, I see a lot like Tim, yay Tim, but uh, yeah. so what is this production? This is Rosalind and the Falcon, which is again, a David Hansen piece. It's funny you should change, choose these two slides. <laughs> Uh, and David wrote, it's, it's uh, uh, from Shakespeare, and it's uh, a combination of Rosalind and sort oh, of- From As You Like It. Yeah, from As You Like It, and sort of pop culture. So the um, Three Stooges were in it, and there was a prince and a king and an evil king who was also an evil queen, who was, you know, the prince was also not really sure of who he was in this world. And, you know, it was just, it was an insane cast. The script was amazing. And I have to tell you that the three of them as the Marx brothers yeah. were redonkulous. They were utterly redonkulous. Who are, who are they? I know Tim. Charles Hargrave, uh, it's oh. um, uh, Val Kilmer, not that Val Kilmer, our Val Kilmer. Kilmer yeah, yeah. Kilmer, and Tim Gow. Wow, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah. crazy. It was yeah. so weird. Oh, I love the, uh, yeah, I just love the color in the the vibrancy of this yeah. color. So. That was, that's Melanie Bowman. She's an incredible costume designer and she did the costumes for the first and this one. So yeah. for Loki and Lucy and for this one, she was the resident designer at Tailspinner. So. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And we haven't even touched about, we're not touching about the costuming that you do. I mean, today that's another yeah, like it. artist talk <laughs> part three. Yeah. <laughs> that's a part of my old life. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and then this okay. is uh, Mr. Scrooge's ghosts. This is yeah. by Michael Sepacy. And it was, we wanted to do a, a holiday piece at tail spinner. Uh, we, we didn't always do quote unquote Christian holiday stuff. We also did uh, we did Song in the Flame, which was about Israel, a, a, a holiday in Israel, about Hanukkah in Israel and so on and so forth. But um, this, we wanted to do a holiday fair, but we didn't want to do, you know, another Christmas carol. So this is the Christmas carol from the viewpoint of the very disgruntled ghosts. That's fantastic. And it was, again, Tim Gow at the bottom because he was yeah. one of our resident actors. And that's Carrie Williams. And uh, uh, just, it was just an, an incredible, 
Davis Aguila there on the end and yeah. Walker and David. David Munell, yeah. David Munell, yeah, David Munell. And it was just, it was just, uh, it was amazing. It was, it was so much fun. And it was one of those, and um, John uh, Busser played Scrooge. So it there was, it was ridiculous. It was utterly ridiculous. And it was one of those shows that just went, yeah. <laughs> everything was a one liner. It was just a one, two, three, boom. And it was like, oh my God. And that's it sold out funny. almost every performance. It was it was incredible. Wow, very, yeah. very cool. All right. I can't remember. Oh, yeah. now there you go. Who so, I am now. Yeah. Incorporating, incorporating fantasy with the with the plays, a large part, a huge part of your creative journey has been with puppets. Yes. Um Talk to me right now because Alison Garrigan is not on your little Zoom window, but oh, it is Lady not. Bats Puppets. Yeah. yeah. Lady Bats Puppets is the name of my uh my puppeting, my my puppeting production company. Uh mm -hmm. it's uh it is the name that I go by as a puppeteer. Um and uh in fact I'm just working on my new website even as we speak. Um okay. and I job out as a puppet designer, I'm a puppet fabricator as well. And I'm also a puppeteer. I teach puppeteering. I work with puppets. I work with dolls. I've been a puppeteer since I was knee high to a grasshopper, thanks to my grandmother, who was also a puppeteer. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and as I said, I did an internship with Jean Hare for puppets. Uh, but I, it's really only been since I started Tailspinner that I, have really come to realize that this is probably who I want to be when I grow up. Gotcha. This is definitely where I have landed, felt the most happy, felt the most comfortable. Uh, I get to use my carpentry skills. I get to use my uh, fabric, uh, fabric manipulation skills. You know, my, my skills as a fabric artist, I get to use painting, sculpting, just bringing inanimate objects to life in whatever form that that takes. And it's, it's just been incredible. And the wonderful thing about it is you never have to see me. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's, it's, a, it's being able to express myself without ever being what people are seeing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's a whole open, it opens up a whole new Vista, which is amazing. So the first one we have is also a tail spinner. Okay. Uh, this is the boy who stole the sun and other native American stories. This was uh, a collaboration between tail spinner and Lenac Lake Erie native American council uh, in the telling of creation stories from three different uh, native uh, indigenous families, uh, Anishinaabe, uh, um, Hopi and um, Oh my lord and uh mm, yeah mm -hmm. anyway thank you it's all right. i'm sorry my, my brain just went and anyway right. uh and so it was three different stories all about how different parts of the world were created and the boy who stole the sun was the inuit story um which i had originally produced as part of my cpac grant my uh a creative partnership for arts and culture uh, mm -hmm. grant that I got in 2016, where I got to travel the country visiting all of these other children's theaters and puppet theaters and, mm -hmm. and whatnot, and gathering uh, stories, cultural stories uh, as I went. And so I originally did that as the, the culminate, you know, the culmination of that grant, and then wanted to actually tell it the way it was supposed to be told yeah. through Native American lens, not through the cis white gendered woman lens. Yeah. And uh, so we worked with them very closely with them and we produced this story and there are, there were four or five different kinds of puppets in this show. And so it was really for me as a puppeteer, it was wonderful to be able to produce different types of showcase, different types of, of puppet, you know, puppet design and puppet usage, but it was also a wonderful way of making the characters more universal for the audiences that were seeing these three different tales mm -hmm. and from these three different peoples and uh, who were all part of a larger cultural group. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the, the puppet on Bryce's hand here in the top picture is what they call a glove puppet. It only comes to about here and everything is manipulated, you know, through here and the hands move and the mouth opens and, you know, stuff like that. Then the, the turtle was actually, uh, they call it a um, stationary 
puppet, which was part of the furniture. And then its whole head would come out from underneath as, and use the bed as its shell. And then it was on a long rod inside of a tube, a flexible tube, so that it would look around and it could talk and it could you know, look around that way. And then the puppets down at the bottom, which we can get into a little bit more later because I know we have another slide of them. Yeah. The, the um, Aglu, the, the killer whale. Um, and this was one of the great things because being from the Pacific Northwest, this is a, an art form that I'm very familiar with. This was, it was a two-dimensional. It was not, you know, like if you turn it sideways, it was flat, but yeah. it was all done on rod and stick with a flexible mouth so that it could still talk. Oh, so you, okay, okay. Yeah. Wow, wow. That's a that's an ambidextrous like person that can work. Wow, very cool. Davis Aguila, ladies and gentlemen, one of the best yeah. volunteers I've ever worked with. Yep. <laughs> so tell me really quick again. So what organization did you work with to to make sure of the authenticity that you were staying true to the Native American? That was LENAC and uh, Lake Erie Native American Council, and we had uh, members of each of the communities that were uh, each of the the uh, indigenous tribes that we were representing. Uh, come in and work with us on each piece. Mm -hmm. And we had, uh, um, I'm having aphasia, I can't think of the word, uh, uh, you know, consultants, thank you, consultants, yeah. who worked with us at every single rehearsal to ensure that we were actually telling the story through their own voices, not in, you know, not overlaying our take on the story. Yeah. So yeah. They kept us honest, they kept us, you know, they made sure that we were actually telling the stories we were supposed to tell with their voices, not what we pictured their voices being, which was amazing. Right. I always call it when, 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 like cultural tales get like a uh, homogenized. Yes, you know, they get whitewashed. They get homogenized, whitewashed, acmed, if you will, and it, it takes away the richness of that of that culture. And I'm, right. it, it's one of the things that I always love about the work at Tail Spinner that you did was. It, it really dove deep into, you could see the research yes. that went into like the history, the history of that, of, of that country, of that, where the tale came from, you know, right. and it was always, it was always spot on, so. Well, and we, we whenever possible, we, which was about probably 90% of the time, we made sure to uh, have members of that cultural community involved on some level on stage as often as we possibly could, but if we if we could not, uh, we would make sure that we had the blessing of that community to do it and to make sure that they were involved in in keeping us true and not trying to take over our perspective. You know, trying to make sure that the that the authenticity of the story and of the voice was there. Right. So that was that was huge. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so this next one. This is also a tail spinner. This is from Prince Yvonne and the Firebird. This is a, um, um, a harness puppet. She, when standing straight up, this is Baba Yaga, and this is Prince Yvonne and the Firebird. So she's you know part of that whole cultural legacy, but not necessarily in the Firebird story. So we sort of blended two things together. Mm -hmm. uh, at her full height, she was over seven feet tall and her wingspan was 10 feet. She took three people to run her. There is a human being in the middle and then each of the people on either arm were the drivers and they developed, they actually have one hand on the actual puppeteer's arm. So behind Bobby Yaga's arms. And so they, the three women got together and in training, we developed a hand signal language that would let her know, the person in the middle know when they were in the right place, if they needed to back up, if it was safe, could they go right, were they going left, you know, we're bending down now, change your weight, whatever. So yeah, it was, it was amazing. I mean, watching and watching these three women work together was ridiculous. They were so, so dedicated. And I, and everyone in this, who worked with the puppets on this show were insane puppeteers. But I have to tell you, Carrie Williams, honestly, is one of the most gifted puppeteers I've ever worked with. Wow. She just is insane with puppets. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. I need to do an artist talk with Carrie Williams at some point in the world, so. But, all right, so, okay. This is the same show. This yeah. is also Carrie. Um, this is a, uh, she is a, a, a sleeve puppet, a glove puppet. Um, and this Fiona Firebird is one of my favorite puppets that I have ever made. She is all fabric. 
um, and the arm goes all the way up into it and then the hand comes out and that beak is made out of latex and is flexible. And so she's completely movable with however the person's arm can move. Mm -hmm. And Carrie brought this thing to wildlife on stage and she's got fur for feathers. She's got uh, rhinestones for eyes. She's got various Christmas decorations as, you know, for the tail and for the things on top of her head, but a plume on top of her head. And just one of my favorite puppets ever. She became the, um, sort of the ambassador for Tailspinner. She began to go out with us everywhere we went to sort of greet people. That's, it's just, it's beautiful. And I love how the puppets are just like extensions of like everything melds, the costume, the physicality, it all melds into one being. So yeah. yeah the collaboration with, a, with costume design and set design and everything else was really yep. key. You know, Wonderful. and then and then just working with Carrie and whoever was the puppeteers to to do this insanely beautiful job with what they were doing. You know, Carrie Carrie's such an amazing physical actress, anyway. You know, yes. and I remember I, I did one show with you guys as assistant director, and I remember the the work that went into even auditions auditions were insane. I mean, they were wonderful. You know, you always left feeling like you got the heck of a workout of your, because the physicality, the physical demands that go into like working one of these shows with the puppets or even with the actors, you know, I mean, it, it's such a, it's such an intense process, oh, you know? Yeah. yeah. And it's thorough. So well, and one thing I will say is I, I do demand a lot from the people who work with me, but I give as much as I ask for. Oh, yeah. And I would yeah. never ask anyone to do anything that I wouldn't do myself ever, you know? Oh, yeah. You were on that stage with everybody else all the time. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, Look at my 60-year-old butt up here doing these things. If I can do this, you can do this. Well, yeah. And I think, again, it comes with the level of commitment that you have to a piece. You don't, you know, you don't have ask something when you, you got, go you in. You all in or why are you doing it? You know, it's Especially. basically the way I look at it. So, yeah. yeah. And Absolutely. it really shows, it really plays back to, um, we've got one more slide to go through with favorite puppets, yeah. but it really goes back to an aspect that we really didn't discuss is you as an educator, you know, because yeah. a lot of the work that I know that you've done, I mean, I've I've been taught by you as well. And even if it's not like the traditional, hi, this is a person with a master's, blah, blah, blah. You've had so much experience and you've been such a guide, awesome. you know, doing workshops and doing specialty classes, things like that. I mean, like really fostering and really like supporting artists in their journey, so. Well, I think that that's really necessary. And I think unfortunately it's something that gets skipped a lot. I mean, I think that you have to, there has to be a connection with the artist you're working with. And there has to be, you have to let them know that they're free to fall. And that if they fall, one of the things I was worked with, for instance, when I direct a show, particularly, not necessarily like when I'm doing a musical or whatever, but one of the things that I work with is getting people to, to know each other well enough and to understand. And when I say trust, I don't mean stand on this thing and fall and we'll catch you. I don't mean right. that. You've worked right. the stuff that I've done where you get comfortable and trusting enough of the people around you that you know no one's going to let you fall. And if somehow or other they do, they will be the first person to be helping you back up under your feet. Yep. Because you have to be unafraid to make mistakes. That's the thing I've always said when I'm directing a show, when I'm working on a piece, I always say, I want you to make mistakes. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't want this to spring full fledged from your head. I want you to fall down. I don't mean fall down, but you know. Yeah. yeah. Down, but I want you to make mistakes because that's freedom. Yeah. And knowing that the mistakes you're making aren't going to kill things. You know, it's like I, this mistake, I learned something from it. And guess what? It actually wound up not being a mistake. It was a happy accident or whatever, you know. Yeah. But there has to be that, that freedom to, to do yeah. stuff. So, yeah. And I think that even to take that one step farther is, is to acknowledge the fear yes. and do it and do it with it. Yeah. Take the fear and be, okay, I fear this, but know that the, know that the environment is safe 
right. and no, uh, and supportive and safe uh, in all aspects, like technically safe, um, you know, spiritually safe and emotionally safe and artistically safe so that, so that you can go, I'm scared shitless. I'm going to do it anyway, because yeah, as you exactly. said, they will, they will catch you. Or if you do fall, they'll be right there to pick you up. And so. nobody will ever judge you for it. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, what I, one of the key phrases I've used, and you've heard me use this, is that when I'm working with people, part of the, the warm up that I do is, you know, acknowledge it, catalog it, bless it and release it. Yep. You know, and I think that that's really important too. Oh, yeah. And I think that before we hit the last slide, I think it, it just reminded me now that before I, when I was trying to decide with uh, like uh, going into masters for acting or directing, I remember talking to you about it one day and you said that um, there are two types of directors. There are the, you know, and there's more than that, but for you, sure. there is the the director, the technical director, like not tech is in theater, but like the technical director who will show you the process and will, okay, do it. And then there is a teaching director yes. who will also, and neither is, neither is like negative or positive, but you They're went- They're very different teaching. kinds of directors. Yeah, very absolutely. Very different kinds of directors. Yeah, and you were a teaching director. I and, get that. No. So yeah, so I still, that still sticks with me, so. But I also like to learn from the artists I work with too. It's a two-way street. So, you know. Yeah. yeah. I, and the shows showed that, you know, yeah. I know that they were in some of the theater that I've ever worked with. It was some of the most collaborative process. Well, thank you for that because I think it's really huge. I think collaboration is key on any project you're in, you know, whatever that collaboration winds up being. I think that there has to be in the arts, you have to, you have to be free to voice your artistic self because if you're not then why are you doing it you know exactly, exactly. So. So, and speaking of we're going to end with oh no it's not yet but uh, four of the favorite puppets we got two more slides yes yeah this this i can i can tap on pretty pretty quickly this is the princess and the nightingale um it's funny all of these the puppets that you're showing are from tailspinner i actually have worked at a number of other theaters as well but i'm glad that we we are using these um the uh these were the king and queen of siam and they are uh, made of poured porcelain, poured porcelain. Um, I sculpted them and poured them. And one thing I do wanna say is that I'm not just the designer, I'm also the fabricator. And I think that's important because there's a difference. There are puppeteers who design and then hand off. There are puppeteers who build for other people. All of them are incredibly valid and wonderful things to do. I happen to be one of those weird people who, if I designed it, I wanna build it, you know? And I don't necessarily wanna build somebody else's design, you know, it's just, right. just who I am. But um, these are made out of uh, the, it's not It's not actual porcelain, but it's, it's a fake porcelain. It's a mm -hmm. uh, fraud porcelain, if you will. Uh, and they are rod and stick puppets, which means that there's a stick in the back that you hold them on and then you have to hold the hand, the two hands in your, one hand and, and learn to manipulate it with your thumb so you can move the two hands separately. Yeah. Um, and I love these characters because I love their faces. I just love them. They're, they're, yeah. They were so much fun. And they were about maybe nice. just tall. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So then this is the last one. Yeah. 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 So this is also from the boy who stole the sun and these are called mask puppets. And one of the things I love about these is that they are 3d, they are soft sculpture and you wear them on your hand and you put them in front of your face and then your body, your physicality becomes that of the character. But then the second you take it down, you're another character. And then yeah. you can it back up again without a change of costume, without a change of cast member, without a change of anything. And this was really wonderful because this is, there's a lot more expression that's possible with it than wearing an actual mask mask, you know? And also just the stylization of it was really amazing. And um, this is Adam Graber and uh, Davis Aguila. And again, two amazing puppeteers and performers. And this is from the Inuit story. This is from the actual The Boy Who Stole the Sun about why uh, it takes place in Alaska and you know where it used to be dark all the time except for the Northern Lights. And then it became how the midnight sun came to being and then turned into the regular sun and then all the other things. Oh, wow. um, and it just was, again, this was probably for me, one of the most 
it gave me a whole set of tools in my toolbox that I never had as far as storytelling goes and uh, and working with other, you know, with other cultures and other peoples. Um, and it, it just, it was such, such a hard project and everybody in it that I worked with on it was just phenomenal. Gorgeous. So, yeah, absolutely yeah. gorgeous. Okay, so I am going to stop screen sharing for a Yay. moment. Here we are again. Um, so you talked really quick. I know we got to wrap up, but you talked really quick. What are some of the what are some of the other um, theaters and stuff that you work with creating puppets? Um, well, let's see. The most recent uh, I worked with the Cleveland Playhouse. I designed puppets for their tour um, uh, of Jacked. Um, I've done multiple years of puppeting for Great Lakes Theater Festival for their educational department. Um, I've also designed the sets for their tours um, in the past. Um, I've worked with Near West Theater. Um, I've worked with uh, a couple of independent productions. Um, mm -hmm. And I've worked with several schools um, as far as that goes. And th those are here in the area. I've also done, I've also done creations that I've shipped out to like Colorado and, and whatnot like that. So wow. yeah. Wow. yeah. Crazy. So what do you got? Um, you got anything coming up next that you're working on or? Uh, I am, uh, I just got through doing the puppets for uh, Anand Sea Tales over at Near West Theater, which is uh, written by Nina Domang, directed by Nathan Henry with an insanely talented cast of people in it. Uh, and I did all of those. And I also did the Anand Sea uh, articulated spider legs that are on him as well. Wow. Uh, Anansi the spider is who it's based on. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I am directing a show for near, uh, for uh, uh, Blank Canvas coming up in the summer. I don't know if I'm allowed to say what it is, so I can't, no, but well, well, yeah. big show. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that's, that's my most mm -hmm. upcoming stuff. Um, and then I'm working on getting my website up and running and there'll be a store on there that also will, because I also do dolls. Um, I do felting dolls. I also make puppets to sell. I do, um, I do these things that I call wall goils, which are um, here, I'll step off yep. camera here and you can see. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think I can get off the wall easily. They're I'm just, loving all the stuff on your uh, on your shelves behind you. Oh yes, I have all the all the things. Yeah, um, yeah but these are wall goals. Oh my they're gosh, just, they're just flat. They go on the wall. And, yeah, uh, yeah. And so those, those are, are awesome. My, he's fun, and I, cool. do, I do green men, and I do you know stuff like that. So basically, it just keeps me out of trouble. But you wow. know, Very but I'm working on that. I'm hoping to have it up within the next few weeks. Um, and um, yeah, that's kind that's of what I'm doing. First of all, I'm glad that, I, I mean, I, I'm excited to see upcoming works that you're doing and that you're progressing. And I just, um, I will make sure that um, the links to the theaters are um, when we do the post of this. Oh, so great. Awesome. people awesome. can find out more about the upcoming shows, but I, um, it's, it, yeah, I keep saying that, but um, I have loved all of the artist talks that I've done, but I really, um, I'm I'm happy that I I got to sit down and you shared with us your story. Oh, thank you. Like, uh, it's it's been wonderful to be here. I mean, I yeah. I find well, first of all, I always love talking to you, no matter what the format is. But uh, the um, the thing that's that's interesting for me is is what I had said before, and that it is isn't really until people start asking me questions like this that I start going, huh, okay, yeah, mm-hmm. And I really start thinking back on some of the things that I have done in my life. And it's, 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 I'm not going to say that I'm ego free because that would be bullshit, but you know, I think that it's what it's, I wouldn't be an artist if I was ego free. Exactly. <laughs> but, exactly. Uh, but I, I really don't, I think, I think when you're in, immersed in doing things that you believe in, you mm -hmm. sometimes just lose sight of what you've left behind you. Right. And I don't mean as in walked away from, I mean, the trail you've left behind you. I don't, I don't honestly think that you always think about who you may have had an impact on or what you may have changed or, or how you might have butterfly affected some of the things in the room. You know what I mean? And I really appreciate the fact that you, you were willing to sit me down and ask me some of these questions too. I mean, it, it really means a lot. Absolutely. Yeah. Reflection. I mean, 
we're, we, uh, I mean, as, as creatives, we're often like work for the next project and the next project and the next project and really having a moment to, especially someone that has been, if for, has been doing this for a while, you know, it's good. I, I like the, I, I like the uh, light that comes from the people that I interview when they really take stock of what they've done. And it's, yeah. um, yeah, it's really cool. It's cool. So I am going to say thank you. And Ooh. I, um, yeah, thank you everybody who uh, we, again, we will download this onto our, um, our social media sites and the website. I know that we are, it's been in the making for a while, an artist page for, uh, well, this has been in the makes, but we're actually um, an artist page. Oh, um, oh I see. The yeah. archives yeah. of these um, on social media. It's just, it's one of the, like, like we're, we'll keep uh, going back to it, but creating a space for these so people can go back and look at them. Awesome. Um, yeah, I just, it, it's a huge part of my job that I love. And the creative, the creative freedom that like my team gives me to be able to do things like this to um, just to, you know, engage with the artists in the community. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Allie. And thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, we will see you again. Um, look for, I'm not quite sure who's coming up next or when. <laughs> Can we, we've got Pride coming up soon. So but, um, yeah, look for it. And this one will be posted soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right. And.